views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of the station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. This show's audio was via a Skype call. Welcome to Cultural Brilliance Radio, the DNA of organizational excellence with Claudette Rowley. Conversations that are transforming the world of culture and business. Claudette brings fresh, innovative perspectives that push the boundaries of what organizational cultures can and should be. Learn how to catalyze your organization's workforce into an authentic, intentional, and financially successful culture. Now here's your host, Claudette Rowley. Hi, everybody. I'm Claudette Rowley, and you are listening to Cultural Brilliance, the DNA of Organizational Excellence on Transformation Talk Radio. Stay with us for the next hour and let us help you explore some groundbreaking ways to transform your company's culture. Twice each month, we have some of the foremost experts on organizational culture and leadership, helping you understand how to make a brilliant culture the rule rather than the exception. Today, I am especially excited to have Julie Wilson with Mm -hmm. us. Uh, Julie is um, the founder and executive director of the Institute for the Future of Learning, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping transform the industrial model of education. She has over 15 years of experience building effective learning environments that unlock human potential and enable organizational culture to adapt and grow during times of change. Julie graduated from Harvard's Graduate School of Education with a master's in technology, innovation, and education. And what's exceptionally exciting is that her brand new book, The Human Side of Changing Education, just launched today. Congratulations and welcome, Julie. Thank you, Claudette. It's great to be here. Oh, congratulations on the book. Yes, I just actually emailed the the publisher before this call because they had discussed May 11th as being the launch date. And I just wanted to know, should I be celebrating tonight or should I schedule that for another evening? (laughs) They told me I should expect an advanced copy any minute now. So fingers crossed. If if you hear a doorbell, that that might be the book arriving. (laughs) That might be the book arriving. Wow. Talk about hot off the press, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So speaking of the book um, and the human side of education, what what inspired what inspired you to to write this book and put this message out into the world? Sure. So <clears throat> the, the human side of changing education is is quite intentional. There are many uh, change plans, be it in schools or even in any other industry, uh, <clears throat> strategic plans, which, as I often say, oftentimes go to the the fifth shelf on the bookshelf or binder heaven, uh, because yeah. in many ways, designing strategy, uh, dreaming of strategy, getting your planning process together, but that's, that's the easy part. The difficult part is implementation. And that's, that's because your beautiful plan hits the human reality uh, of what, what's currently existing. And when I think about schools changing and I think about the, the imperative uh, for school transformation, that basically requires a lot of adults to change. And I just wasn't seeing a whole lot out there with regards to tools or resources that would help adults make that shift. So I decided to to write my highly biased views on that and uh, folks have found it to be helpful. I teach a lot of workshops uh, and coach leaders uh, along the principles that I discuss in the book. And it's just something that I've got a, a great deal of passion for, uh, helping helping adults change. And so, so needed. I was really, uh, I, I was flipping through the book. Uh, the, the, the PDF version was just so uh, impressed by the, how pra- it's inspirational, visionary, and practical all at the same time. That's what really struck me, right? It was, it's such a, it's a, it's a, it's a really visionary roadmap for what's possible in education. Thank you. Yes, I, I'm a farmer's daughter, so I wanted it to be practical. I wanted it to right. be both visionary and uh, to give the reader some tools, strategies, techniques that you know he or she could take into a faculty meeting tomorrow and say, "Hey, uh, let's let's take a look at this and see what what will be a good fit uh, for our school or district." And so one of the things I know you talk a lot about in your work is moving away from the industrial model of education. And so for listeners who aren't familiar with that, what are we when you say industrial model of education, what are you talking about? Yes, when, when I think of the industrial model of education, I think of the one size fits all 
model of education, that we have this system that's designed to put kids into grade levels according to age, uh, not according to their developmental stage, uh, and to basically take them through a prescribed curriculum. And as we as we know in this day and age, the world is moving at a really fast pace. And the military coined uh, the term VUCA, uh, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And, and that's the world that we live in. And uh, for too many too many kids, the, the, their school hasn't changed and hasn't hasn't kept pace. Uh, and with that comes a lot of significant shifts. So it's moving away from uh, students as passive recipients of content uh, to students as more self-directed entrepreneurial learners. Uh, the shift from teacher as deliverer of content or sage on the stage to teacher as designer and facilitator of immersive learning environments. The shift from time-based learning to competency-based learning. So a lot of significant shifts when we think about this industrial model and the changes that we're being called upon to make. Yeah, and I, I love, you know, the first chapter, What's Worth Learning, you know, your North Star, right, of, of learning <laughs> and education. And, um, you know, and some of the things you've mentioned, self-directed learning, creativity and innovation, the planning, adaptability and agility, strengths awareness, global citizenship, relationship building, critical thinking. These are all some of the things in the table of contents um, mm -hmm. for listeners. And what struck me as I, as I read that was, okay, almost every adult I know, every leader needs to get better at all of these things, mm -hmm. right? It, yeah. it, I read it and I thought, wow, this could be a leadership development, right? <laughs> a table of contents in some ways. Um, I'm just curious what you're, you know, do you see the same kind of parallels? Uh, yes, and you've actually hit on um, the, the reason why I, I wrote the book and what brings me to this work. So my background isn't in K-12. Uh, I've worked for almost 20 years now in adult development uh, and behavioral change. And I started to notice this theme emerge after about a decade of that work, which was that so much of what we're helping adults do uh, in leadership programs and in these development programs is helping them unlearn what they learn through a standardized system of education. Uh, and then that brought me uh, sort of back to K-12. And I started to research uh, schools where they were doing really innovative work. And I remember visiting my first uh first of those schools, it was the New Tech Network Columbus Signature Academy out in Indiana. And those kids, the 14 year olds, uh, were learning how to manage and implement really complex projects. So they were learning how to think critically, how to build relationships with each other, how to coach and give feedback, how to leverage strengths, how to plan, how to be uh, adaptable. And I remember uh, saying to one, one of the girls in particular, uh, Janice, I think her name was. Uh, I said, Janice, you've, you've got skills that I teach 30, 40 and 50 year olds to learn. <laughs> mm -hmm. And she said, wow, I think I might like to do that myself uh, whenever I'm older. And I said, well, you could probably do that now. You're, you're, you're so good at it. So yes, there is this, um, there's essentially this parallel path of development uh, that I see that if we're asking kids to learn these skills, in many ways, we need to provide the support and resources for the adults to learn the same skills in, in parallel. Yeah, it strikes me. One of my, uh, a friend of mine is the director of a Waldorf school and she talks about how routinely, you know, kids in their school are go to, you know, really high level colleges, Ivy league colleges that they, and I just, it's, I think a lot of what you're saying is that the way that they're learning differently, they're learning more critically, right. They can, there's a different kind of complexity to their, how they're, taught to think, right? And mm -hmm. what they're able to explore. Yes, uh, I love the Waldorf uh, model. It's it's really immersive. It meets the learner where they, where, where they are. And I, I remember actually reading, uh, I think it was the, the opening lecture that Rudolf Steiner gave at the first Waldorf school. And he talked about the importance of strength of character, depth of feeling and power of thought. And it really struck me when I read that, oh my word, this was back in roughly 1918, I think, 1919. Mm -hmm. And essentially it's the modern day equivalent of that would be emotional intelligence, grit or resiliency and critical thinking. So, mm -hmm. you know, although I have this nonprofit called the Institute for the Future of Learning, in many ways, 
we're catching up with what the great educators and pedagogues have always known, which is that this more progressive model of education is what will equip kids uh, to really not just survive, but to thrive in any given context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think it, and, and it's, that's a really interesting comment. I remember my friend mentioning that as well about Steiner, right? hundred years old, right? A hundred <laughs> years ago, this was said. And yeah, in different language than we would use today. And I love how you translated that into emotional intelligence, grit, resiliency, and, and critical thinking, right? And then yeah. if we equip our kids to be able to do this and our adults, that really changes how we can we can solve problems. Yes, and then yeah. also, I mean, one of the um, one of the sad things that I hope that I hope we're we're going to address. Um, is the equity part of this. So the Waldorf education, that was originally designed for the kids of the employees of the Waldorf factory in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, Maria Montessori, uh, she started her work in the slums of Rome. But over the course of several decades, this work has morphed into the middle and upper middle classes. So my hope is through the book that we help, uh, essentially help broaden what is possible for, for kids uh, in all environments, particularly those kids in poverty, who I think uh, there, there's too much of doubling down on the traditional model for those kids. Definitely, yeah, and that's a great point, right? That how, how a lot of this originated was to help kids who didn't have as many resources, right, or access to resources. Mm -hmm, um, exactly. And now, we, and now we see that it's, it's shifted and switched, absolutely. So one of the things that at the beginning of your book that I love, I'm gonna read it, um, it's one of the opening pages and it says the core of change is learning, which is ironic. Our institutions of learning are slow. Some might say even immune to change. And I just, I loved that. I'm like, what I, I love, you know, just it's, it's sad. The irony is sad, but what a great way to articulate it that we, you know, schools are about learning. Education is about learning, but our schools seem like they are entrenched that it is so hard for them to change and I was curious if you could comment on that what has what has created some of this 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 inability or immunity to saying hey we should really change this yes uh it, it, it's, it's an interesting question and the one of the biggest challenges I think is the doubling down on process and system so whenever it comes to trying to change a school, too often uh, we're looking for a guaranteed result. So in order for me to really embrace this, I need to know that we've got some guaranteed outcomes. But that flies in the face of what is really needed, which is an appetite for failure and an appetite for risk. And in, in many ways, it's understandable uh, because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm probably okay with you taking a risk on somebody else's education, but probably not my child's. Right. So I think there's a great opportunity here for uh, outreach to parents and parent education to say, look, the model that we have, the system that we have, it's not flexible enough and it wasn't designed uh, to support kids in 2018. Therefore, as a school community, we're going to start piloting some new things. And we have some really good evidence, research-based practice that we're going to start working with. And we need your support as we start to work work through this. And, and, and there will likely be some failure that goes along with that. And that involves taking risks. The flip side of that is learning. So too often when it comes to learning, uh, we want it to be right and we want it to be perfect the first time. And there isn't space or time or resources available uh, to really take risks. And, and and that's key. That's critical. That is really, that is really, really critical. Thanks for articulating that so clearly. And I'd love to explore that further when we come back from a break. So you are listening to Cultural Brilliance, the DNA of Organizational Excellence. I'm Claudette Rowley here with Julie Wilson and stay tuned. We'll be right back. Conscious Confidence Radio, a timeless wisdom with Sarah Main. Tune in each month on Transformation Talk Radio and join Sarah on an adventurous journey to the deeper level of meaning to move beyond today's world of constant change, confusion, and uncertainty beyond the shadow of fear. This hit show explores key concepts such as confidence, values, and attitude in a dynamic way. To learn more about Sarah and her work, visit sarahmain.com. Stay juicy. Tune in to Your Juicy Love with me, Una Drake. 
co-hosting monthly with Dr. Pat, and every second Monday at 12 p.m. on Transformation Talk Radio. My show, Your Juicy Love, helps you find the dynamic, life-affirming love you've always wanted. Transform your relationships and bring peace, joy, and juicy, juicy love to planet Earth. For more information, visit unadrake.com. Are you stuck in unhealthy habits, toxic relationships, or low self-esteem? Do you crave a life of inspiration, love, self-acceptance, and fun? Sounds like you're on the verge, on the verge to your next big thing. Join Laura Richer, host of On The Verge Radio, helping you use your breakdown for a breakthrough, overcome life's greatest challenges, and live the life you want and deserve. Tune in each month on Transformation Talk Radio or visit seattlehealinghypnosis.com for more information. Tune in to the hit show, Raging Skillet Radio, mouthing off with Chef Rossi. Chef Rossi mouths off about different subjects in pursuit of breaking down walls and opening up your minds. She and Dr. Pat banter back and forth, taking from the headlines of the day on subjects that reach beyond what goes on in the world into your hearts. And go to theragingskillet.com to find out more and let Chef Rossi know what's on your mind. Please join us for a transformational conference with five, that's right, five of the leading pioneers in the fields of science and spirituality, all in one place. Join best-selling authors and teachers, Greg Braden, Dr. Bruce Lipton, Lynn McTaggart, Dr. Joe Dispenza, and Lee Carroll in both individual workshops as well as a weekend of keynote presentations and panel discussions. At this extraordinary event, you'll get to experience some of the brightest leaders of our world today empowering you with groundbreaking new information, deep wisdom, and practical tools to transform your life. Come connect with others and expand your consciousness in beautiful Nanaimo on Vancouver Island in British Columbia, June 14th through 19th. For more information or to register for what some are expecting to be one of the best conferences of 2018, visit shalohaproductions.com. That's S-H-A-L-O-H-A productions.com or visit the individual speakers' websites. We're back on Cultural Brilliance, the DNA of Organizational Excellence. I'm Claudette Rowley, and for those of you just joining us, my guest today is Julie Wilson, who is the author of a brand new book called The Human Side of Changing Education. And uh, Julie, we've just been having, I think, a very interesting conversation, really like looking at education in ways that I think we're normally not talking about in society. I know you've put out some ideas that are really, I think, groundbreaking here in this book. Well, thank you. Thank you. I uh, I hope some of them are implemented. That's the (laughs) the idea. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. That's absolutely true. Um, And Julie Julie and I are both... uh, background in change management, organizational development. And as, as consultants, that's always something we want, right? It's like, mm-hmm. it's, it's fine to have the ideas, but they need to be implemented because we actually are trying to help get something done here, right? Yes, in- you're, you're reminding me of um, uh, a great quote by Peter Drucker, whenever people would come up after any of his workshops or his lectures and say, wow, that was wonderful. You know, that was groundbreaking. And Peter, being the very action-oriented and humble guy uh, he was, would say, that's wonderful. Uh, now, what will you do differently on Monday morning? Mm, what a great question. What a great question. Yeah. What will you do differently on Monday morning? <laughs> and that's when we know something's changed. Um, exactly. Yeah. And I know one of the things we were talking about before the break was this idea of, and the importance of educating parents, right? So that if, you know, how do educational, how do educational institutions change? Well, one of it, you know, parents need to be willing to look at education a little bit differently, right? Mm-hmm. to be flexible, to, to have a little bit of trial and error, knowing that it's going to lead to something better. Mm-hmm. And one of the things, you know, I was thinking about, and we chatted about a break for a minute, is that my son, for example, goes to one of the best high schools in the state we live in. And that's really, you know, we're very fortunate. It's very lucky that he's there. And one of the things that happens in that high school, and I think happens in a lot of schools um, that are high-performing, or public high schools that are high performing is this pressure on the kids, right. To get high grades, to go to great colleges and that they, they actually, there's less freedom to fail, right. To, to learn, knowing that learn, you know, failings quote, quote unquote is part of learning. 
Mm-hmm. And it, it's interesting. What we notice is it's less from the teachers and administration are actually very good about saying, hey, this is really about learning, right? This isn't about mm-hmm. getting space. But it's the other kids, it's other parents where there's this, this culture that develops of this rigidity. And one of the things that I think is con- it's concerning in and of itself, but it's also concerning when we think about those kids becoming adults. You know, where's their resiliency? Can they fail? You know, I'm just curious to get your, your take on that. Sure. Uh, you're, you're reminding me um, of a school that I visited up in Portland uh, a couple of years ago. And I was having a, a chat with some of the students there and they have this really neat uh, project-based curriculum. And I was curious to sort of, you know, at where the students' heads were at and we had a Q&A. And I'll never forget one of the students asked the question, when do I get to do what I want to do? So I sort of probed a bit deeper for the question underneath the question and asked her to share a bit more. And she said, well, uh, I know I need to do a whole bunch of things to get into college. uh, And and I know that I need to do that, but, but I don't want to do any of it. I'm I'm, I'm not interested in X, Y, and Z. What I'm really interested in is ABC. And that's not really filling any college application check boxes. When do Mm. I get to do, do that? Can I do that in college or do I have to wait until after college? And it really struck me that I have the same conversation with adults all the time, where in leadership coaching conversations, there's this sense of, I, I, can't, I can't do X now, I'll wait until I'm retired, or I'll wait until some point in time whenever it's, quote, safe for me to do this. And the reality is there will never be a good time and it will never be safe, because mm-hmm. my grandmother would have said that's not the way the world works. And... Mm-hmm. And in the book, I talk about uh, the narrative arc and the hero's journey of of change, of personal change. And I think if our school system did one thing, and that one thing was helped kids build a resilience to try and try and try again, and to really build up that sense of self-efficacy, then we would have a fundamentally different generation uh, of talent on our hands. Because... The reality is there is no guarantee in this world of going down a particular path. But if that's in your heart to do that kind of work or to take that risk, then there is great learning for you on that path. And when it comes to failure and schools, uh, there is such a pressure to get get it right and to get it right first time. And and in my mind, that's not learning. That's not deep learning. It's, it's surface level learning. And there are lots of stories of kids graduating from college with perfect GPAs and being somewhat unmoored at the end of it. I mean, even, even at Harvard, uh, one of their most popular classes was how to be happy. Wow. Now, mm-hmm. now you would think that, you know, having gotten into Harvard, you're ecstatic, uh, but, you know, there's so much pressure uh, to check those boxes and to essentially, you know, not fail, that once you get there, the the stakes become even higher. So yes, I, I think if we could all go through a number of years of a real immersive experience as a kid of trying stuff and failing and that, viewing that as feedback and how can I course adjust and, you know, self-correct and how can I calm this inner critic that will be with me for the most of my life uh, and help manage that then that would be huge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's so true. You know, what happens when kids, you know, develop a kind of resilience where Mm -hmm. you can just, you can bounce things back, bounce back from things, you know, yourself, Mm -hmm. Um, you, you, you gravitate toward what you actually want to be doing, Mm -hmm. um, which is risk taking sometimes in and of itself. Certainly. Yeah. Yes, yes. The the whole you know consumption uh, model of education is grounded in a, a model of compliance. Mm-hmm. So I am rewarded for not taking risks and I'm rewarded for not failing. And the result of that, the end result of that uh, for many kids is a sense of learned helplessness and waiting for permission. Mm-hmm. That's neither a great way to put it. Yeah. Neither of which will help you in this, this wonderful world. No, no, right. Being rewarded for compliance, exactly. Um, and at, and waiting for permission, asking for permission. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was re- reminded of my, uh, oh, my son was in middle school. I may have told you the story. He, the middle school he went to, the principal, when, when we went, you know, to the sixth grade orientation, and the principal talked about, and I was so impressed by this, she talked about the importance of trust. 
she talked about uh, the importance of failing. Mm -hmm. Um, She talked about um, that you're not, that it's important to pay it. These are three or four things she talked to with the kids a lot. It was a theme in their school around paying it forward was important. And that in life, the first time you do something, you know, most of the time it doesn't work the way you'd hoped, right? Mm -hmm. That you, it's not gonna. And she said, she also talked about the fact that, that her, that she would have weekly faculty meetings and everyone would go around the faculty, would go around the table and talk about a way that they'd failed. And her Ah. point was, yeah, was to actually, that they should be, failing around, you know, trying something new in the classroom, trying something new with a particular child, that they should be taking risks on a weekly basis to push the envelope to innovate. Um, and then they had to go around and talk about how something didn't work as mm, a way I to normalize. That. Yeah, that experience. And um, and it was interesting because when my son finished there in eighth grade and, and at their eighth grade, moving on, you know, slash graduation ceremony, they talked about, or she talked about the four different, you know, pay it forward, things don't always happen the what you want the first time, et cetera. Um, mm-hmm. And my son, you know, I said, wow, I was so impressed by your principal and what she talked about. And he kind of rolled his eyes like, oh yeah, she says that all the time. Everyone just laughs about <laughs> it. Um, being, you know, middle school kids or 13. And, yeah. but the importance of having heard it over and over again, I have to imagine, you know, got into their heads, right? At some point and that it made, well, it helps later. Yeah. Yes. And the fact that your son said, she says that all the time, if that's gotten to his level as a student. That, that 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 says a lot. That means that leader uh, had been consistent for a significant period of time, uh, really, you know, steering things towards that north star, and 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 that's huge. So that you know, it wasn't just this this vision that changed on any given year, uh, and you know, adults get a bit of whiplash when that happens. But rather, okay, these are the principles that we hold to be true and dear, and yeah. this is this is how we operate as an organization. I love that. Yeah, it, 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 and I, that's a great point. You know, if it, if it get, if, if a kid can recite it, right, it's gotten into their yeah. consciousness, they've heard it enough. And especially if they make fun of it, that might, means they actually paid attention. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> you have to understand your audience, you know, um, but it, it, it helped, you know, it really, it gets, it gets in there and that makes such a huge difference, makes such a yes. huge difference. Um, yes. Yeah. And I was curious, um, you know, before we go to break, what, You've, you've visited so many schools, right? But I'm curious, is there, you know, one, not one, but just one of your many, many favorites, an example of a school that exemplifies um, a lot of the things that you, you write about in the book and that you think are important. Is there a favorite story, for example? Mm, gosh, let me think. Yes, there's a school up north here uh, and actually it's another Waldorf school. And what really impressed me about that school was how interrelated everything was. So they had the good fortune to be basically, it's basically a farm. So Mm -hmm. uh, lunch, for example, the kids have grown the vegetables. Uh, The kids have also cooked the lunch (laughs) Mm -hmm. and the kids are also cleaning up the lunchroom. So Mm -hmm. there isn't this sense of all of these separate things, but rather, uh, and it was a boarding school, you know, this is our community and this is our environment. And the kids were building skills and learning biology and learning team building and learning math, uh, just in a really interrelated, uh, interconnected way. And I remember um, just the various art projects, how deep and complex the narrative that accompanied each of those art projects was. It's it's very hard to pinpoint just one thing, uh, which is often the yeah. case with a really great curriculum uh, and approach to pedagogy. But rather you pull the thread here and it pulls 25 different threads elsewhere throughout the school. It was I just, it, it was one of the schools that I visited, I thought, I don't want to leave. Just this environment is so conducive to learning. I could stay here and hang out for a long time. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And it wouldn't, wouldn't it be great for our kids to always feel that way about school, right? Um, and I love that that sense of integration. So mm-hmm. let's take a break. When we come back, we will revisit what integration actually looks like in education. This is Claudette Rowley, and you are listening to Cultural Brilliance, the DNA of Organizational Excellence. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. A word of caution. 
If you prefer the status quo and you are not interested in improving every aspect of your life, this book will trigger the shift out of you. The Truth is Funny, Shift Happens is available now. Author Colette Steffen brings the powerful knowledge and life-changing energy and empowerment from the radio airwaves to the pages of her new book. To get your copy in paperback or ebook, visit thetruthisfunny.com today. Are you ready to stop stress, anxiety, and low self-esteem from running your life? Join award-winning author Dr. Friedemann Schaub for Empowerment Radio and learn breakthrough solutions to switch out of survival mode and approach every day with great ease, joy, and purpose. Tune in the first and third Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific to Empowerment Radio with host Dr. Friedemann Schaub on Transformation Talk Radio. Visit the fear and anxiety solution.com to learn more. Tune in to Knowledge Book Radio with host Marge Potasic each Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Through many experiences, Marge was led to the Knowledge Book, a gift to humanity in its transition to the Golden Age, and it provided the truth and the answers. She now shares information from the Knowledge Book with you each week on TransformationTalkRadio.com. For more information, visit USA.TheKnowledgeBook.net. Are you ready to make deep, lasting, transformative changes? Then tune in each month on Transformation Talk Radio for Susanna Jameson's hit show, Love Light Sound Radio. During her show, Susanna inspires and supports spiritually and health-conscious individuals all over the world to reconnect with their hearts, their inner peace, and balance. Love Light Sound Radio. Transformation happens here now. For more information, visit SusannaJameson.com. Cultural Brilliance Radio. I'm Claudette Rowley here with my guest today, Julie Wilson, who is the author of the brand new book, The Human Side of Changing Education, How to Lead with Clarity, Conviction, and Courage. So Julie, would you, I'd love to have you share with listeners how they can, how can they find out more about your book? How can they find out more about your consulting work? Sure. So the book is available for pre-purchase right now on Amazon. So just type in the human side of changing education and the pre-purchase uh, option should come up there. Uh, also, if you're a school or district and you'd like to purchase bulk copies, if you go to the publisher website, which is Corwin, uh, C-O-R-W-I-N, uh, I think they're giving a 30% discount for 10 or more copies. And if folks go to my website, which is the-ifl.org, that's T-H-E hyphen I. F as in Frank, L as in Larry, dot org, and click on book. Uh, there you'll find some downloadable resources, uh, which are free, and they accompany the book. Oh, thank you so much for that, Julie. Sure. Um, yeah, and so nice you included some resources for folks um, to be able. Yeah, it's just it's great. It's great to have those takeaways, right? Those more concrete pieces you can you can take and and uh, and review, right? And just get sounds like some get some great ideas from them. Yes, there's a yeah. there's a roadmap that goes with the book. So again, we talked about the book being practical. So this is just a little roadmap you can download and uh, sketch your ideas and your thoughts and your notes as you read through the book uh, on the roadmap. And then a couple of additional tools. Uh, one is a template for an individual development plan that you can use for uh, administrators, uh, fellow teachers, faculty, et cetera. And then also a change capacity questionnaire, which really highlights some great areas for uh, administrators and cycle to be to be thinking of to increase their change capacity oh excellent wow those are great resources thank you sure um and is the assessment something that you created uh it's something that i amended it was actually created mm -hmm. by uh two guys uh bono and kerber uh, out of bentley uh, college here in mm -hmm. massachusetts and they're their methodology is more sort of generally organizational focused. I changed the language to be more school and district centric uh, with, with their permission. And it's, it's a wonderful resource to help help identify where, where are the key areas we need to work on to help build change capacity as a team and as a school. Mm, wonderful, wonderful. One of the things you talk about in the book, and I know in your work a lot, is this idea of a human-centered approach to adult development. 
Mm-hmm. So what is, for, for, for regular people, what does that mean? What is a human-centered approach to adult development? Uh, well, it's this whole concept of uh, you can't mandate development. <laughs> and, uh, a friend of mine, uh, when we used to work in a training and development part, department, said, you can't mandate training. You can mandate bums and chairs, but you can't mandate training. So yeah. it's it, it's really uh, meeting learners where they are and mm-hmm. and building from there. And too often we miss the opportunity of change uh, because change is an opportunity to develop people through work. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're trying to shift the focus from, okay, here's the sh- strategic plan and here's the change management process you know, where we manage people through this change, but rather how do we mobilize people uh, to implement this change and what sort of development uh, and support might they need as they work through this change. And one of the biggest supports that I see is necessary is really being mindful of developmentally where, where are people. And uh, Bob Keegan out of the Harvard Graduate School of Education has done a lot of really phenomenal work over the course of his career uh, breaking this down. And he talks about three stages of adult development, uh, socialized mind, self-authoring mind and transformational mind. And according to Keegan's research, the vast majority of adults are either in socialized mind or making that transition from socialized to self-authoring. And when I think about a traditional school, uh, a traditional school essentially honors a uh, socialized mind. So I will do as I'm told and I will you know, steer my course according to, to the values of this school uh, based on compliance uh, and consumption. Uh, but if we're saying that we want kids to be more creative, that we want them to be more collaborative, uh, that requires uh, the adults to take risks uh, and that requires me to be more self-authoring. So mm-hmm. there's, a, there, there's a real developmental task here for the adults and rarely is that discussed and even more rarely are supports provided for adults uh, to work through that that change and that developmental transition. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that because I think that's such an important piece of this integration you were talking about before mm-hmm. of of meeting really meeting people where they are, right? And understanding who who are the adults you have in your school, right? Mm-hmm. What where are they? What's important to them? Yes, and I, yeah, I, was, yeah. I was in a conversation just last week. Uh, there were a number of us uh, talking about this topic of school change. And one of the women said, you know, it just strikes me that we are the wrong people to be having this conversation because <clears throat> we were, quotes, good at school. Mm-hmm. We need to bring in more people who, quotes, were not good at school and ask them what needs to change because that will bring a whole other lens that, that we don't have right now. So a lot of us, myself included, were quotes good at school where you find out, okay, what's the shortest distance between A and B? And, you know, how can I, <laughs> how can I speed my way through that as opposed to how can I really learn deeply? Uh, and, and for adults, uh, too often it's the same as well. Yeah, I think that's really true, isn't it? Let me just get this done, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. If compliance is rewarded if asking for error. Not asking, you're asking for permission is rewarded, right? Doing what you're told is rewarded. Mm-hmm. Um, then, yeah, it just it just is very reinforcing. Um, and I love that idea of asking people who didn't like school <laughs> what should change, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, my husband will still tell you he did not like school at all, and why, you know, and in detail. And <laughs> and it, it's 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 a really interesting conversation to hear. It's kind of actually kind of sad too about what it's like for folks who, as kids, really didn't enjoy school and is because, because of it didn't, even though they were highly intelligent, didn't do very well necessarily. Right. Mm -hmm. Or got in trouble because it just wasn't a fit for them, Mm -hmm. but the kind of personality they had or the way they learned learning style. Right. Yes. Yes, exactly. And there's a, and there's enough data out there that shows us that student engagement levels are pretty high in kindergarten. And then they have this precipitous decline as we go through not so much middle school, but more so high school. So along the way, uh, school is actually promoting a loss of love of learning uh, for too many kids and, and also for teachers as well. Uh, teachers are in a pretty untenable position in some schools where the, the focus on standardized test scores uh, is so prevalent and so pronounced that it doesn't give them any, any, uh, creativity in their own practice as designers and facilitators of learning that they know will engage kids. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, 
I'm curious, do you, you know, when you think about an, uh, you know, an ideal school or a school, ideal is probably the wrong word because it sounds too perfect, but a school that would meet the needs of many different kinds of learners, what are some of the things that would be happening there? Sure. So uh, a school that would be doing that uh, would probably have an interdisciplinary project-based curriculum and Mm -hmm. not project-based as in, you know, let's pull together a scrapbook, you know, at the end of, you know, some heavy content, but rather uh, what are your questions? What what are your questions as a learner? Uh, We tend to live life ideally in the direction of our questions. So let's, let's start that process much earlier as children. And a, a curriculum that's student-centered, uh, that really, uh, as Seymour Papert would have said, seeks to find the gears of the child. Mm-hmm. So a, a good friend of mine uh, shared how her, and oftentimes, you know, this can happen when, particularly when boys uh, start to get into their early teenage years. Her 13-year-old loved school, but then uh, over the course of the year prior, I'd really started to lose interest. And I asked what he was interested in and said, well, he can't get enough of the Second World War. He's just fascinated by it. He, mm-hmm. reads, he reads history. He watches documentaries. And it, that's a great example of that, that child's gear. So he could be learning English. He could be learning language skills. He could be learning math. He he could be learning a whole host of skills uh, and different content through that gear of being fascinated by the Second World War. So so why the Second World War? What is compelling to that child? And how can he be much more self-directed? And also how can the curriculum be centered around him in such a way that will really sustain and increase his his motivation to learn. Yeah, what a great example. I love that. That makes such a difference, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. If you can yeah. engage someone in something there, this is adults too, I think, right? Someone yeah. they're really, really, something they're really interested in, they ignite their passion, it's going to mm-hmm. spill over, right? Yeah. Into so many <laughs> other different areas. Yeah. I'm, I'm just laughing. I'm thinking about another example. A parent once told me that she was literally at her wit's end because her 15-year-old was uh, starting to skip school and just she was literally at her wit's end. And uh, a friend of hers was a life coach and she said, okay, can you help my kid? And she said, yes, but I'm going to start with what he wants to learn uh, and there can't be any agenda that you bring to this this coaching. So it turned out when the coach met with the, this 15 year old, she said, okay, I'm here to help you learn. What would you like to learn? And he said, I would like to learn how to speak to girls and ask them out on a date. <laughs> I said, okay, let's start there. <laughs> That's an amazing story. Let's we start where people are. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. It's it, it's so interesting in that whole piece around teenagers, right? Anyway, mm-hmm. yes. And I'm giving, to, yeah. we're, we're back to developmental stages. There's a lot of lot going on there um, mm-hmm. in that uh, in that middle school uh, teenage transition, and how much of that is being brought to bear to the curriculum. So something like bullying, you know, that mm-hmm. that instead of you know a standing line outside the principal's office, let's talk about. Um, how to respect difference and how to get your needs met in a group and how to express anger and how to express when you're not getting uh, what, what you want. Uh, and also helping kids learn what they're going through from a neurochemistry perspective, even you're just this incredible rich learning there again, all meeting the learner where he or she is on their developmental path. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's another uh, that's another great example. It's so um, there's so much common sense in this, mm-hmm. which I really I really love. Um, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we are going to Julie's going to share a couple of recommendations, suggestions, and things you can really do if you want to pull this into your own school. You're a parent who's listening, and you're thinking about your own child and how to meet them where they are. So you're listening to Cultural Brilliance Radio. I'm Claudette Rowley. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Gifted intuitive healer and spiritual teacher, Sarah Luce, brings her unique style to the hit show, Small Steps, Big Breakthrough Radio on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Tune in each month as Sarah turns reality on end and shows us how to experience expansive results with simple yet powerful steps. 
Expect an enlightening bend on what you currently believe is possible. For show details and upcoming topics, visit sarahloose.com. That's S-A-R-A-L-O-O-S dot com. Let it go radio. The future awaits you. Tune in each month on Transformation Talk Radio as host Barbara Scheidegger explores the way to clarity, peace, and how to live a successful life on your terms by turning negative experiences into positive ones. Barbara's curiosity about the human experience drives her both personally and professionally. As a life coach, author, and renowned clinical hypnotherapist, Barbara knows how to move forward in a natural, organic way without side effects. If you want to grow, be sure to tune in to Let It Go Radio. To learn more, visit LetItGoHypnosis.com. Tap into the wisdom of animals, angels, and masters with Darcy Pariso on Animal Soul Wisdom Radio. Tune in monthly as Darcy brings insights on how to better understand and deepen our relationships with animals. Working with light and pureness of ancient techniques, Darcy, healer, animal communicator, and medium is here to guide you through this process and provide inspiration to move forward. For more information about working with Darcy, visit DarcyPariso.com. Living Lighter Radio with Jason and Patricia. We have an ecosystem approach to your life. Tune in weekly every Monday at 1 p.m. Pacific on Transformation Talk Radio as we, Jason and Patricia, discuss what's truly holding you back. We offer you the tools you need to reach your goals and at the same time be living lighter. For more information about Living Lighter, visit www.livinglighter.org. Miss any shows during the week? Don't worry, we've got you covered. With the free Transformation Talk radio app, you'll have access to all of the past week's shows in the palm of your hand. Tune in to Transformation Talk radio anywhere you go with our free app for any of your devices. Check out our app in the App Store and Google Play Store today. Are you stuck in unhealthy habits, toxic relationships, or low self-esteem? Do you crave a life of inspiration, love, self-acceptance, and fun? Sounds like you're on the verge, on the verge to your next big thing. Join Laura Richer, host of On The Verge Radio, helping you use your breakdown for a breakthrough, overcome life's greatest challenges, and live the life you want and deserve. Tune in each month on Transformation Talk Radio or visit seattlehealinghypnosis.com for more information. And we're back on Cultural Brilliance Radio. I'm Claudette Rowley here with my guest today, Julie Wilson, the author of the brand new book, The Human Side of Changing Education. Uh, and Julie, we, we were just talking on break how we've had a we've we've had a very free form conversation today, uh, which has been a lot of fun. And um, one thing we wanted to make sure to touch on is what recommendations you have, and you've been giving recommendations, but really focusing that here, recommendations you have for um, schools, for parents who are listening around this, this concept of how do we meet people, adults and kids where they are? Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, a couple of recommendations, Uh, think about schools and leadership teams here, as you think about helping build change capacity uh, in your school or district. I I love William and Susan Bridges' book called Managing Transitions. And in that book, they talk about the distinction between change and transition uh, and give some great tools and techniques and strategies to help help navigate that terrain. And in in a nutshell, uh, the distinction between change and transition, change is external, and it's essentially an event, something that happens to us. And transition is internal and psychological. So an example would be moving house. Uh, on any given day, truck comes, load the truck, I'll be the same day, offload the truck, you know, you've moved house. Uh, that change has happened. But the transition to that house becoming your home, that's a much lengthier and that's an internal process. So I, I love that book. That's a great one. Um Let me think, uh, for parents, uh, anything by Sir Ken Robinson, uh, I love his TED Talk, his TED Talk, Changing Education Paradigms, I think Mm -hmm. is the most most viewed TED Talk uh, at this point, over 40 million views. And he he breaks down uh, the traditional model in a very engaging way. And if parents haven't seen that yet, 
I would strongly encourage them uh, to check it out and, and to do so. And then if, like me, you geek out on adult development, I would recommend anything by Robert Keegan. So his book, In Over Our Heads, uh, is an introductory uh, text to these stages of adult development. And then also his follow-up, Immunity to Change, digs more into the competing commitments that can sometimes be at play that mean organizationally or personally uh, we're getting further and further away from the outcomes that we seek. Another great mm. book. Yeah, another, thanks for all those resources. I think I also love um, Robert Keegan's book and everyone culture. Ah, uh, yes. In my, yeah, some of my work in, in cultural consulting to deliberately developmental organizations, which is very much in alignment with everything we've been talking about today, right? Which is really mm -hmm. meeting people where they are and creating a culture where people are developing. Yes, that's, an, yeah. that's a great recommendation. Yes, absolutely. And I think I could see the applications in schools as well, mm -hmm. um, you know, with that book. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, I've actually um, started to work with a couple of schools as they think about, okay, how can we become a deliberately developmental school? And I think in many ways, this is the holy grail uh, for school, for schools and for schools to change. Because if, if they can nail this, then they will really become a true learning organization. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things I know you um, just crossed my mind that you talk about in the book is in, you know, when you change the pedagogy, you change the culture, right, mm -hmm. of a school. And I think that's so often change and culture, and I'm, I'm looking through my, my lens, the lens of my work a little bit right now in this comment, are mm -hmm. viewed as separate from whatever's going on. Like, oh, changing culture sort of over here, and then we have pedagogy, or we have our, you know, if it's a manufacturing company or whatever kind of, you know, organization you are, right? Then we have all yes. that over there on the other side of the room. And these are inextricably linked, right? You can't separate them. Yes, and, and, and I would argue that, you know, your, your culture work is even more important than whatever strategy work uh, is underway. And I'm, I'm blanking on who said this, but... Uh, quote, culture Trump strategy every time is... Oh, Peter, or uh, Drucker, Peter Drucker. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Drucker. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, it's true. I mean, it's, and it's something that I think more and more organizations are becoming uh, aware of. And also the fact that if you want to change culture, you're talking about a three to seven year commitment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To really, yeah, to really have it stick and depend. Yeah, right. And is that what you're mm -hmm. noticing with schools? It's really a three to seven year commitment? Yes, yes. And, and yeah. that's something that, that I talk about in the book. Uh, I talk about five different success factors. And the first one is uh, a, a visionary and a supportive school board and sustained leadership. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the average tenure of a superintendent in America is three point something years. So if we're saying that culture change takes three to seven uh, there is this massive churn that happens where <clears throat> a new superintendent comes in, he or she starts a strategic planning process, and that's usually, you know, finished after about a year or so. And then you've got really only maybe 24 months to implement, which is enough time to start, uh, I think, tilling the soil and planting the seeds, but you're not going to see any real growth in that time. And if the superintendent leaves at that point, you get a new leader in, then that cycle just continues and you're not really... Uh, you're not giving the time necessary uh, for the new culture to take root. That's such an important point. The practicality of some of this is often overlooked when you look at it through that lens of how long is the superintendent there, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to make an, an amazing impact on the success of what you're trying to do. And in a school particularly, how do we know that the culture has shifted? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that's, that's a really good question. I know, it was kind of a challenging in any culture, right? How has it changed? How has it changed? How do we know, right? Yeah, and I know there are a number of um, assessments out there that help uh, mm -hmm. that, that help to bring some data to bear. Yeah. Uh, I, I think about when it comes to a school starting this process, uh, how clear are you on your North Star? Uh, right. What is the vision? And if you can answer these four questions, then you're going to have a very clear direction and you're going to get a clear sense of the culture that's needed to support it. Uh, and those four questions are, and these are, these are from uh, David Parkins, what's worth learning? How is it best learned? How can we get it taught that way? And how do we know it has been learned? So right there, you've got the four 
pillars of curriculum, pedagogy, teacher development and assessment. And those those pillars uh, are that really if those elements are incorporated into your North Star, then you've got a much better sense of how the culture needs to shift in order to support those. So if we're saying that what's worth learning is creativity and collaboration, then it doesn't take a big stretch for the community to understand that we need a culture of creativity and, and you know effective communication in order to support that. So your North Star is what will help dictate uh, what you're looking for and what's meaningful uh, in your culture development. Thanks for mentioning that. I think that I, I love those four questions. I remember seeing them, and I and I and it's true. If you have a sense of your North Star, which in this case is right where where you want your educational culture to head, then you you can really start, as you said, start to get those metrics right or those measurement points in place and say, have mm-hmm. we arrived here or not? Mm-hmm. Um, in a fairly straightforward way. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. And I love that first question. What is worth learning? I mean, I actually I read that and I thought, you know. We could apply that to almost any organization. I mean, not just schools, any organization. What is worth learning, right? Because we're not going to change until we've learned something. Yeah. Exactly. We can even use it for our New Year resolutions. What's worth learning this year? What's worth learning? There we go. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Julie, I want to thank you so much for today and for sharing such great information with everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Claudette. This was great fun. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Congratulations on your book. Um, For anybody who just joined us, The Human Side of Changing Education, How to Lead with Clarity, Conviction, and Courage by Julie Wilson. Definitely check it out. It is an amazing book. I've, I've, I've read a lot of it and I'm incredibly impressed. And thank you to everybody for tuning into Cultural Brilliance Radio. As always, we had a great time. Please join me the second and fourth Fridays of each month at 1 p.m. Eastern and 10 a.m. Pacific. Have a great couple of weeks and we'll see you back here next time. You've been listening to the hit show Cultural Brilliance Radio, the DNA of organizational excellence with Claudette Rowley. Conversations that are transforming the world of culture and business. You can download this podcast and find out more about Claudette and her breakthrough work at ClaudetteRowley.com. Please contact Claudette and find out how you can create a brilliant culture. 